Okay. So, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for coming to our keynote with Professor Jeremy Wolf. Um, let me just say a few words about Jeremy before I pass the microphone to you, Jeremy. So, um, Jeremy, our lecturer, um, Jeremy Wolf is a professor of ophthalmology and professor of radiology in Harvard Medical School. He is a director of the Visual Attention Lab in the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard University. Jeremy Wolf studied in Princeton and received his PhD in 1981 from MIT under the supervision of Richard Hill. His research focuses on visual search and visual attention processes, more recently trying to bridge theory and field practice by investigating more real life search situations such as medical image perception, such as radiology and cancer screening, visual search for security purposes, such as baggage screening in the airport and more. Jeremy has published over 200 peer reviewed articles. He has supervised dozens of students, which probably many of them you know, and he received numerous prestigious grants. His, paper ha his papers have been cited nearly 40,000 times, by no means an outstanding achievement. Jeremy was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and served as the chair of this economic society and as a member of the board of the Vision Science Society, the VSS. Jeremy also served as editor of the journal Attention, Perception and Psychophysics, APNP, and he was the founding editor in chief of Cognitive Research Principles and Implications, or CREEPY, a journal that is devoted to this bridge between lab research and field applications. Finally, Jeremy has a central role in the North American Jewish Reform Union with which he visited Israel a few years ago and even met Bibi Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas in order to bring peace to the Middle East. And this is probably the one place in which Jeremy has utterly failed. <laughs> so we have the honor to have Jeremy here as our keynote in the ISCOP conference. And without further ado, I, I pass the microphone to you, Jeremy. So please. Go ahead. And um, I'll just mention that um, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat. Um, and we'll open a, a question sessions at the end of the lecture. And you can ask either by the chat or by raising your hand. Um, and Jeremy, the stage is yours, please. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted that this is a a Zoom meeting and not a webinar, because that means I can actually see some of you, at least the ones of you who are willing to keep your cameras on. So please do, because it's much nicer to give a talk to, uh, to, to, to real people. Um, and um, I, I, I really liked the original plan better. I, I really was looking forward to being in ACO. Um, but uh, as you know, this is the way our life is these days, and we'll just have to uh, we'll just have to deal with it. Um, so uh, let me say at the outset that um, I'm of course talking about the work of all sorts of people other than myself. I'm the one who gets to give the talk. Oh, this isn't even one of the slides. It could have been a slide with Nareet. Um, in it if we'd gotten the right lab picture doesn't happen to be this this is i think the last lab picture when we actually could do things like take lab pictures and not all hide under the bed um and i should thank also the uh, na the, the national uh, institutes of health and the national science foundation who um fund the research that I'll talk about today. And one more thank you. Uh, this, this particular talk is based on work um, that is collaborative with uh, Ben Wolf and Anna Kosovicheva. Um, you may uh, notice the similarity in the last names here. Um, my, my son and daughter-in-law have gone into the family business, which is very nice. They're in, uh, uh, they're now faculty at University of Toronto at Mississauga. Um, and we, we work on rather similar things. Um, so to begin with, what I want you to do is find uh, Loki the cat. Um, and you can take a look around this scene. 
uh, wave, wave, wave if you found the cat. Oh, good. Most of you haven't. Um, either that, or most of you aren't paying attention um, and and don't know what is to wave. Um, so there's the cat. Uh, you you should probably see that. Uh, it depends, of course, on on the screen that you're looking at. But that cat should be pretty visible. Um, so a fair number of you failed to see the cat. Um, why did the, the the core of this talk is why did you fail, um, and why do we care about? the fact that you you failed. So uh, we, we care about the cat um, because it's uh, the, the failure to find the cat is logically similar to um, other more important failures. Like for instance, if you were a radiologist and missed that particular spot, that's a mass in, in a mammogram sign of breast cancer, you'd really want to, uh, you'd really want to find it. Um, and experts miss critically important targets like that with some regularity. So brand new study just out in the last couple of weeks looked at so-called interval cancers. Um, women get screened in the US every couple of years and interval cancer is a cancer that makes itself known one way or the other, not at screening, but between one screening and the next screening. And the first thing you do when you find it, not the first thing, one of the things you do if there's an interval cancer is you go back and you say, could we have seen this the last time the woman was screened? Um, and in this particular study, at least a quarter of those cancers were um, clearly visible in the previous screen. And it's not that the radiologist didn't look, it's that the radiologist didn't find and report. Um, so there are a number of reasons why this might be the case. Uh, I don't know uh, what your viewing situation is at the moment, but if you happen to be looking at uh, looking for this cat on on your iPhone, for instance, yeah, the image may just be inadequate um, to to find the cat. But today's topic are um, what are called look but fail to see errors. The language comes originally from the driving literature. Um, and the, these are errors where the image is adequate, the target is clearly in view, and the viewer is sufficiently expert um, to identify what they're looking for. So you're en enough of an expert to identify a cat. A radiologist is enough of an expert to identify a mass in a, uh, in a mammogram. There's a large family of these sorts of errors. And one of the central things that I want to argue here is that a very large family of errors um, are in fact a family. They tend to have been discussed as, as uh, 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 discrete topics for research, but I'm going to argue that they really are a family. Um, so, and this family can range from things like typos in the demo that you may have seen in your intro psych class once upon a time on the left to the famous uh, Simons and Shabris gorilla experiment uh, illustrating uh, inattentional blindness on the right. If you're looking on the left and you still are saying, I don't see anything wrong with what is on the left, I, 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 um, you should notice that the word the is duplicated and doesn't, doesn't belong there. People routinely fail to notice that. And uh, if you notice the, 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 the two thes, great. You still know that in your last paper, um, when, uh, when you got the reviews back, there was a line in there that said, you know, for a smart person, this person should have proofread a little better because here's typos that they missed. And you did look for the typos, you still didn't find them. Um, and I would argue that this is part of, there's no doubt that that typo that the reviewer found is perfectly visible. You just didn't find it and you looked for it. That is, that is a, a version of a look but fail to see error. Well, if I click on that, nothing good happens. Um, this is not just a, a, a lab or visual search problem. Um, ben Wolf does a lot of work uh, on uh, in, in the area of driving. Here's an example that he found of a look but fail to see error. Let's just run that. The uh, 
Now, <laughs> there's some people who clearly saw it. Uh, I thought this is a terribly obvious example, and I showed it to my lab, and 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 a couple of people in the lab failed to notice. Um, so I, I would be curious. Wave your hand if you uh, if you did not see uh, something that you should have seen. Did it just look like a boring? Uh, here, let's run it again, um, and keep your eye on the to the right. If you didn't see that fire truck as it came in, that that's. He still the the odds still didn't see the fire truck. I saw it. I just didn't understand it. That is the something weird that I I, I was expecting a gorilla or something. Oh oh oh! They, well, they, they, a gorilla a gorilla also is a problem. But um, there's no way that this driver should have gone through this intersection with that fire truck in that position. Right. Um, and they're probably lucky that the fire truck was uh, the, the, the the driver of the fire truck was paying attention. Um, in any case, uh, so these sort of errors happen in the world as well as, no, I don't want to see that again, in the world as well as uh, uh, in, in, in the laboratory. And so here's what I want to argue. I'm going to argue that these errors are a result of what I'm going to call normal blindness. I'm going to call it normal blindness in part because it's the product of processes that you know about that many of you on this um, Zoom, in fact, study. Um, these are processes that normally work for us, that work well for us, um, but not always. And um, normal blindness, as I'm going to describe it, is certainly not as devastating to the individual as clinical blindness, as a, as a real ophthalmological blindness would be. Um, but it's a little like Omicron. It's so common, it's so normal um, that the number of serious problems that it kicks up is very, very large, right? The car accidents, the medical errors that happen as a result of this um, are, the, uh, are, are the tail end of a distribution of errors that just happen continuously. They're normal. Um, so there are four causes, I'm gonna argue, for these LBFTS errors. Um, cause one is that attention only selects a subset of what's available at any one time. Cause two is that attention is guided in good ways, but it can be misguided. Um, three, the items that you attend can be attended for an inadequate amount of time. and Finally, your introspection lies to you and tells you that you've seen more than um, you have actually uh, um, registered. Um, so let's start with this idea about attention only selecting a subset of items. We can do this with some simple stimuli rather than uh, you know the, the cars and, and mammograms. So if you're looking for uh, tease in this display, you know immediately, as soon as that slide came up, you knew you have uh, a, a green characters all over, the, all over the screen. But in order to identify a, a T as opposed to an L, you're going to need to attend to specific items. Um, and you're going to do that preferentially within um, a useful field of view or a functional visual field. Both terms get used in the literature. I'm going to stick with useful field of view today, I think. Um, and that's the idea that if you're fixating, say, at the end of that blue arrow, um, you can probably resolve the T that is off to the right of that blue arrow. Um, because there's a region around the point of fixation within which you are processing. And if that T is in that region and it's roughly circular, you can see that there are you know, 12 or 16 items that fall within that useful field of view while you're fixated at that point. Okay, I'm not gonna go through years of the visual search literature, but from that literature, we know that you can process in a display like this, maybe 20 to 30 items every second. Um, we also know that you're gonna make about four fixations per second. So you're only going to be sitting at that particular point of fixation for um, a quarter of a second. 
do the math, this suggests that you will be able to attend to around six of the items inside that useful field of view during the time that your eye is there. And then it's going to move someplace else. And if you didn't happen to have selected that T on uh, that fixation, you won't know that it's there. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to miss the T completely because you'll bounce your eyes around. It'll fall back into a functional, in, into the useful field at some other time you might, may find it. But on this fixation, even though you are for all intents and purposes looking at or very near the T, you won't, um, you won't find it. Um, we can show that by doing a, 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 an eye tracking experiment, Jia Chen Wu and I did this experiment where we tracked the eyes while people were looking for T's and L's. So we've got all the fixations. And what we can do is we can ask from the current point of fixation, we know the distance to the target. What's the chance that on the next fixation, they go to directly to the target, which they will if they find it. Um, and the answer, here's the data, I'm plotting distance um, from where you're currently fixated to the target on the x-axis. Uh, and on the y, you get the proportion of saccades that go to, to the target on the next saccade. Um, and even if you're just two degrees away, which in, whoops, in this display whoop, would be the spacing between letters. Um, even under those circumstances, there's only about a 50-50 chance that you're going next to the T, that you're very close to it. You just didn't manage to, um, to successfully pick it up. By the way, there are four Ts in this display, I think, if you didn't pick them all up. Um, you know, there's another uh, version of a look but fail to see error. Um, so let's do this again um, in uh, something more like the real world. Let's ask about radiologists. What's the chance that if a radiologist looks at or very near to a, uh, a, a target, in, a, in this case, in a mammogram, what's the chance that they will pick it up on the next fixation? Um, so again, this is work with uh, uh, Jia Chen Wu, um, postdoc in my, in, in my lab. Um, what we're going to do is we'll, uh, we, 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 I tracked 24 radiologists, they read a bunch of mammograms, and we're tracking their eyes, and we're measuring scan pads. And in these pictures that I'll show you, um, the, the finding, um, if it's present, is in, uh, in a red box and uh, the saccades are numbered. Um, so you can, you, can, uh, you can see the scan path and, and uh, these scan pads uh, tell a story, really. Um, they're, they're, they tell useful stories about when radiologists miss things. Um, there's a taxonomy of um, errors in, uh, in radiology based on eye tracking data. Uh, that was originally derived by uh, Harold Kandel at uh, uh, Pennsylvania University back in the 70s. Um, and he and his colleagues distinguished between three types of errors. Um, this is a scan path from a, from a so-called search error. The, the, um, the mass is up there in the upper right. You can see the radiologist looked around, but they simply never looked at the target at all. This, on the other hand, is what they called a recognition error. You can see that fixation 12 certainly landed basically on the target, um, but uh, the radiologist moved away uh, almost immediately and did not, uh, did not register it as a target. And that's distinct from what they called decision errors, where you can see here that the radiologist scrutinized um, the area of the, um, of the lesion, but, um, uh, but decided that it wasn't a pathology. So that's the, you know, that's a judgment error, um, and is distinct from, um, just sort of blowing it off in, in, uh, with a, with a single fixation. So you have this interesting, um, uh, continuum of, of errors that Kandel 
talks about. Um, and uh, if you look at a population, if you, if you look at a, a set of trials from a radiologist, you see that all radiologists seem to make all of these errors. It's not that one radiologist is a search error kind of person and another is a decision error. If you were to um, say as a first approximation that about a third of the errors will be search errors, a third recognition and a third decision, you wouldn't be far off from what um, several studies in, in, in this literature have, have shown. But okay, we've, we, with these data, we can, we can do the experiment um, that I, I talked about with the T's and the L's. We'll measure the distance. Where'd my little mouse go? There, we measure the distance uh, from the current fixation to the lesion in the mammogram. What's the chance that the next fixation is going to the, uh, uh, to the target? And we get basically the same kind of data. Even if you're fixated very close to the target, you only have about a 50-50 chance of picking it up. Um, now you might say, oh, well, you know, we know about uh, uh, corrective saccades and, and, and fixation error and stuff. Maybe they just didn't quite get there. If you ask about the next three saccades, sure, you get a little better, but you, you only get up to about 70% of the closest ones. That doesn't sound like somebody asking me a question because they're asking in Hebrew. Um, and if you ask me a question in Hebrew, you only get like three words that you can use because, yeah, and, and, and they mostly involve, do you want to say Chiddush? And I can maybe do that for you. Um, anyway, um, even if you look at the next three saccades, uh, the, the performance is still poor. It's clear that you can be looking essentially at a target in the lab or in the clinic and, and simply not register it. So um, attention only selects a subset of the, 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 the stimuli. So reviewer one says, yeah, 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 we knew that already. You know, for years we've known uh, that, that selection, I mean, that's the whole point about selection. You're only selecting some things. The, the emphasis that I wanna underline is that, um, this is true, not just you know, when you're thinking about the image as a whole, but you're only selecting a subset of what you are looking at right now by any reasonable definition of, of, of looking at, right? The, that within that useful field of view, you're only selecting a subset. Now, this is not a disaster in the real world because attention is guided. I've spent years working on a model called guided search. So, you know, guided I know from. Um, the idea is that, okay, if you're searching for a T among Ls, everything is more or less the same. But in the real world, if you're searching for a particular object, you're going to guide to um, items that might be kind of like what you're looking for. Uh, so we'll do the Where's Waldo, a very stripped down Where's Waldo version. I made this chicken into a Waldo chicken, except in Israel, he's an Effie chicken for reasons that escape me. But in the next slide, I want you to look for that chicken. And you'll see that even if it is the case that as you fixate, I don't know, right about here, that you only process a subset of the items, that subset will be a guided subset. You're not gonna bother uh, attending to any item that doesn't have red stripes on it. It's not that that guidance tells you where the chicken is, right? You're gonna guide to these silly things and they don't turn out to be chickens, but you'll get to this chicken relatively um, efficiently. Guidance, very useful, um, but your attention can be misguided. And one nice way to illustrate that is to tell you about another experiment that we did in the medical image um, uh, space. Uh, this is with a, a postdoc, Trafton Drew, who's now at the University of Utah. Um, we're tracking uh, the eyes while radiologists are looking through lung CT. So this is a lung, actually it's two lungs. Um, and you can see the eyes bouncing around. They're looking for lung nodules, which are little round white 
um, signs of lung cancer, um, the black areas, the lung, those little white uh, circles are your ribs. So this is a CT set of slices through the, uh, through the lung and the radiologist is scrolling um, back and forth looking for these um, lung nodules. I can tell you lots of interesting things about this um, because this is some of the first eye tracking data that's asking, how do you examine a 3D volume of data? Not a, you know, not, not a 2D image plane, but a 3D volume where you have to move back and forth in depth. Um, but what I really wanna tell you about today is um, uh, that, that we did something a little perverse on the last um, case that we showed our radiologists. Um, we popped a gorilla into the lung. Um, here I can boost the contrast a bit, makes it easier to see. Um, so this is a, a big gorilla. It spans uh, five slices in the, uh, uh, in the lung. Um, and 20 of our 24 radiologists um, didn't report it. Now, we didn't say, look for a gorilla. Um, if you do that, uh, everybody finds it, the radiologist or not, it's very easy to find. Um, but a radiologist's job, if a radiologist is looking for lung cancer, a radiologist's job is report the lung nodules if you find them. And if you, um, if you see anything else of clinical importance, you should report that too. That's uh, what's called an incidental finding in, in radiology. And we thought, you know, a gorilla in the lung, that's, that, that would be significant. They should say something about it. Um, very important to say that the fact that 80 plus percent of the radiologists missed this gorilla is not a criticism of radiologists or of my radiologists or anything else. It is evidence that becoming an expert doesn't give you a new visual system. You are still subject to the same sort of limitations that the rest of us are subject to. And so you too make these look but fail to see errors. Now we can think about that in terms of misguidance. We know from the eye tracking that radiologists looked in the vicinity of this gorilla for around a second on average. Why didn't they see the gorilla? Well, they're looking for um, small white round things. And so in the quarter of a second that they're fixating in the neighborhood, let's say, they're going to find you know, four things that might be lung nodules and they're gonna reject them and move on. Um, the problem is that they're being misguided in this case. They're looking for small white and round and they miss big black and um, they miss big black and, and, and shaggy. Um, so attentional guidance, very good thing, totally vital to the way you operate in the world, but sometimes you're misguided. And that misguidance is part of the, the, the package that produces these look but fail to see errors. And says reviewer one, yeah, 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 we knew that too. Again, the point is that it, we, we, we know you can, uh, your attention can be guided over here so you don't look over, over here. But this is saying that within the current fixation, you can also be misguided. Just looking at it isn't enough to uh, immunize you against this misguidance. Um, and yeah, 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 okay, so if you don't select the item, you might miss the item. Let me show you also, to move to the next point, that you're also going to miss items that you do select. It's not just that you miss items that you never got around to selecting. Here's one more paradigm that shows that you actually miss things that you do select. So let me tell you about mixed hybrid search, uh, a topic that Nurit knows all about and has uh, spent years collaborating with us on, um, though not on this particular experiment. Here's the idea. Visual search, you're looking for one target among um, a bunch of distractors, typically. In hybrid search, um, you're looking for multiple uh, types of target 
um, in the same display. The idea of hybrid, uh, the term is originally from Schneider and Schifrin, is that it's a combination of a visual search and a memory search. You have to hold items in memory. Um, and this is a specific type of hybrid search that we'll call mixed hybrid search because it's um, the targets that you're looking for are a mixture of specific targets and categorical targets. So, um, and I'll show you a demo on the next slide. I want you to look for this drink and this specific bell and this specific shoe. And at the same time, you should also be looking for any animal, any type of fruit and any game of some variety. Now, the, we, we developed this, um, it, again, because of this medical image perception incidental finding idea. The idea is th the specific targets are sort of the equivalent of radiologist, I want you to specifically look for lung nodules in this, um, in this um, exam. But also keep your eye out for the broad category of anything that might be clinically significant. So that's the logic behind doing this particular experiment. And um, trials would look like this. You, you can try th these couple of, uh, of, of trials here. Turns out that people are very good at remembering many, many targets. So that, that's not the limit here. Um, but odds are that you have found the, the specific shoe over here. Um, and uh, you would be somewhat slower and maybe less likely to find this lemon, which is a fruit, um, if, you, uh, um, uh, if, if that was the trial. Um, and so here's, we, we did lots of different versions of this, but this is the most striking version. Um, in this experiment, uh, if there's a target present, target on 50% of the trials, if there's a target, 80% of those targets are specific, 20% of them are these categorical um, targets. And here's what the error data look like. They missed 5% or so of the specific targets and over a third of the categorical targets. They were doing horribly on the categorical targets. So that's interesting as a model of these incidental findings, but it's also interesting um, in a theoretical sense, if we think about um, these look but fail to see errors, there is no doubt that that's a visible target, right? It's, it, you're, looking, you're, you're looking for it. It's not that you didn't know that you were looking for it like the gorilla in the lung. Um, it's highly visible and um, nobody has a problem if I point to this saying, what's this? Is it a fruit? Yeah, it's a fruit. Um, we also know from other work that these sort of searches are essentially unguided. You can sort of imagine that. What would you guide to if you're holding six different things in your memory? You just attend from item to item until you stumble on a target if it's, if it's present. So that tells you that the probability of selecting this boot is the same as the probability of selecting this fruit. But the chance that you're going to find the boot, that you're going to identify it after selecting it, is apparently much, much greater in the case of this specific boot than in the case of this categorical fruit target. That's the critical point for this discussion. So even though uh, you have in many cases undoubtedly attended to the categorical target, you're still missing it. What's going on there? Um, so let's think about how you would identify an object. Many of us um, have uh, w w would subscribe to some version of a, of a sort of a classic Ratcliffe style drift diffusion model. You attend to the item, some information accumulates, um, and if you reach the boot threshold, you say it's a boot. Um, and, and good. There's a brand new, very useful, well, it's, I suppose it's a year old now. It's still new, useful modification from Andrew Heathcote's lab um, that he's calling a timed racing diffusion model. 
which makes the following really important point. You can, at, at some point, you just need to give up on uh, not the task as a whole, but on the specific identification that you're working on right now. Um, so, uh, and, and, and to do that, what, what, what Heathcote introduced, Hawkins and Heathcote introduced is the idea of a timing threshold um, that runs in parallel with this evidence accumulating threshold. And if you hit the timing threshold, um, you, you basically stop the, uh, that identification. Um, so I'm, I'm using this uh, the surrealist painting by Tongi as an example that you, know, you, you attend to this object. Um, there's all sorts of uh, object recognition diffusers running, um, but they're not getting anywhere. And you can't just spend all day accumulating information about this. In this particular case, it wouldn't help you anyway. It's, it's not a meaningful object. So at some point, you've got to quit. And so the, what, what, what I take from this is that as you're attending around um, in a search task in the lab or in the world, um, you're working on identifying whatever you've uh, currently attended to, but it's not always worth it to you to spend enough time to really figure that object out. In many cases, you might as well leave. And um, we know from the reaction time data in this mixed hybrid search experiment that it takes longer to identify a categorical target than a, a specific target. So if you uh, place this, uh, th th this sort of item by item uh, threshold even quite far out. So how are you, you going to decide when you've searched for enough time? Inside a, uh, not searched for enough time, how long have you, when should you stop um, accumulating evidence about this particular item? You can only do a few of these at the same time, right? It's probably a working memory capacity kind of issue. So you want to you want to stop relatively efficiently. So you're going to accumulate some experience with how long does it take you typically to identify a boot or a fruit or something like that. And you'll make um, a conservative but not ridiculously conservative decision about when to quit. And if you make this item quitting threshold say out here you're going to end up missing, in this case, categorical targets that you paid attention to, that you would identify eventually, but you simply, in, the set, in, in this particular task, you decided it's not worth it to you. Now we can apply that to the gorilla. One reason you didn't see the gorilla may be because you were guided away from it, but it's pretty salient. Maybe you did pay attention to it. Um, if you did pay attention to it, we know that if you're looking for a completely unexpected thing, um, it's going to take longer typically to, to accumulate the evidence for that. Um, and so we can't, it, it, there, there's no good way to tell which kind of error it is, but logically it is entirely possible that you looked here, you paid attention to the gorilla, but um, after some accumulation of information, you decided there was nothing here that you were going to get that was useful and you moved on, even though you had selected that target. Uh, so attended items can be processed too briefly. The reviewer says, yeah, it's nothing but a speed accuracy trade-off, but this is not at the level of the task. This is not that you bailed out of the task um, too early. You can think of this as a sort of a speed accuracy trade-off, but it's happening continuously on every selection. You need to be able to decide that um, there's no point to just, you know, I, I, if, if, if I've got a, um, a, 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 an accumulator that's asking, um, uh, you know, where is, uh, where is Shaul Hochstein or something like that? Oh, where did he go? Maybe he fell asleep, who knows? 
Um, but if I'm if I'm actually looking at Yaffa, um, at some point I should sh I should decide that I'm just not accumulating good Hochstein evidence and move on. If I spend the day staring at Yaffa's box on 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 on, on the Zoom, I, I you know it's well I, I suppose it would be profitable in its own way, but it's not a good idea. Um, last point, one of the reasons why all of this is um, a topic of endless interest to us is, be, uh, is because we're endlessly surprised by it. And we're endlessly surprised by this because our introspection is designed to, um, to, to, to give us a coherent understanding of the world and tells us, it doesn't tell us, um, oh my goodness, I don't know what most of this is. I didn't have time to select. It's, it says, you know what's happening. You're looking at a Zoom screen. You know, if, if um, you, you, you have a perfectly good theory about it at any given moment. And we can illustrate that with these lovely little dancing chickens. Um, you had a theory about that. You saw a bunch of chickens that were dancing around on the screen. Um, I ask on the screen now, did you see a destroyed chicken? Boaz is nodding his head in the direction that suggests no, he didn't. Um, even though he saw that slide several times, I was, you know, I saw that destroyed chicken when I when I showed this particular version of the demo in my lab earlier this week. Um, somebody else said, I saw that destroyed chicken down on the lower left. This is my demo. I hadn't even realized that I had this chicken down, uh, down there. The point is that if you didn't happen to select the chicken, not only did you fail to find it, um, but you also um, were perfectly convinced that you knew what was there. It wasn't that it was out of view. It was that you had generated an, uh, a, an introspection um, that seemed complete, but was in fact not the case. So attention only selects a subset of the stimuli, even where you're exactly looking. Attention can be uh, misguided, again, even within the current uh, of useful field of view. Um, you need to stop attending to items relatively quickly because you need to move on to the next item. Um, and introspection lies to you about all of this and tells you there's no problem here. You're seeing everything until you get hit by the, uh, until you get hit by the fire truck. Um, so I, I will stop there. If you are sitting there saying, why is he showing me a collection of mangoes as the last slide? Um, probably you missed the, uh, the, 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 the little parrot who's in there, clearly visible once I direct your attention to it, but uh, all those lovely processes will otherwise direct you away. Um, so uh, happy to take questions. Uh, I mean, Nareen, thank you, you very much. Me? First of all, yeah, thank you very much. Please unmute yourself so we can. Oh, thank you. Clap to Jeremy, thank you. Uh, um, and, and I thank uh, Ben Mernick for uh, saying, um, explaining that Effie is Effie because uh, it, it's uh, AFO Effie. I should have been able to figure that one out. That that should have been in my six word Hebrew alphabet, uh, uh, vocabulary. Um, all right. Uh, just before we move on to the questions, there was one question in the chat. Let me just read it to, for there? you. So oh. um, Ronit asked, were the radiologists timed while viewing the scans? Um, they, they weren't under a time limit, um, if, that, if that's what you mean. I mean, we, we certainly know how long it took them because you know, we're, we, we have an eye tracking record, but they, th this was not a, uh, a time pressure issue. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's important, right? You, you could say for a variety of these tasks, oh, if I didn't give an instruction that said, please respond as quickly and accurately, you know, our standard 
instruction, respond as quickly and accurately as you can. Um, if we hadn't stressed the quickly part, maybe you would make fewer errors. That's of course true. Um, but uh, if you think about driving, for instance, the real world exists under these um, uh, please respond quickly and accurately kind of constraints. You don't get to scrutinize the intersection all day. Um, you either drive through it or you don't. And um, so absolutely true that time pressure makes a difference, um, but that's, uh, th that's just part of the overall picture here. Um, okay, great. So, so we have a few people wanting to ask questions that raised their hand, and then, I, and then I'll um, ask a few more questions in the chat. So Sharon, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy, thanks for a great talk. I want to ask about the mammograms, although um, crossing the intersection is also life-threatening. But if we um, relate to the mammograms, um, you were showing us data that is um, relative so that radiologists make mistakes. But I want to ask if the same, if you look at a specific um, mammogram, are they consistent in the mistakes they make? Or if you show the same um, scan to a few of them, would they make different mistakes? Because then the probability of a few of them going over something would be, you know, uh, increasing the probability to actually um, detect one. So, so my, so, yeah. Yeah, so the short answer um, is, uh, is yes, both. Um, it's certainly the case that there are harder cases and mm -hmm. easier cases. Um, but it is not the case that everybody misses. If, if you take a look at the set of errors, mm -hmm. it's not the case that everybody misses the same um, ones. There seems to be a, um, an idiosyncratic or random component. Um, if when you invite me back for uh, for the talk, really in Israel, by uh, I may have a, a a more quantitative answer to that because you have just described. Uh, I aim one of a grant that we just landed, um, oh. which is the question of um, how much, uh, to, to what extent are these sorts of errors, what you could call stochastic, mm -hmm. right? Just exactly. you, know, you randomly picked the wrong item and so you didn't find the T. And um, to what extent are, are they um, more deterministic? Yeah, and you um, and can also give some quantification as to how many radiologists should scan uh, something before they, you know, you can really be sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer to that is more radiologists than you have. Oh. <laughs> right. So, so the, uh, there's no doubt in the radiology literature that double reading reduces errors, mm. right? If you get two radiologists looking at it, that, that, that certain, which tells you again that it's not completely deterministic. Yeah. Um, the... Um, uh, Europe double reads. I don't know what Israel does. America doesn't double read. Um, it's no actually idea. one of the uh, better arguments for computer-aided detection in a mammography that, that the um, computer can act as the double reader. The problem with double reading, of course, is you need twice as many radiologists. Um, there are ways around that, but that's a different topic. Thank All you right, very should much. I, should I Thank go you. to Roni? Yes, sure. Jeremy, do you want to maybe unshare your screen so do you I, can see this, everybody? Okay. Unless you need the screen. No, 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 no. I'm stopping sharing and I can, and okay, I've been there we go. seeing all of you all along here, but uh, well, at least 30 of you all along. Okay, so uh, Ronnie, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you so much uh, for this lovely talk. I wanted to ask about the last point, the point of introspection uh, and the, the wrong narrative of seeing more than we actually see. So do you think that what happens is that we create the wrong story or do we create a different percent? Like in my mind, there was, was there no exploding chickens when I looked at it or am I just convincing myself that there was no exploding chicken? Like, is it a story thing or is it a change in percept? Um, that is an interesting and very difficult um, question because all of these questions surrounding what would, 
the, the problem with all of these things is you, you, you end up being able to ask about them after the stimulus is gone. If you, if you point to it while it's happening, you, you, you direct attention there. And, um, and you know, so then of course you see the, uh, the destroyed, um, uh, the destroyed chicken um, in, uh, so if, if, if you're thinking about this in, uh, you know, Simon's inattentional blindness gorilla land, you can almost undoubtedly find, uh, if, if you stuck electrodes in the right spot, or you know, put 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 the observer in the right um, uh, the, the fMRI machine. Um, you'd be able to show that the gorilla is having some impact on the visual system. If you're asking, did the person see it? Um, that's very tricky. I actually invented the notion of inattentional amnesia to raise this issue. I never really believed it. But I, I, I put forth as an argument for research the idea that maybe people saw the gorilla, but by the time you ask about it at the end of the experiment, they've completely forgotten about it. And um, actually, Simons came along and did some nice experiments showing that's probably the strict amnesia story probably isn't it. Um, but it, it's, it's very difficult to know um, what the difference is between changing your perception and changing your uh, uh, t t and changing your story just because it's empirically difficult to get uh, at, at the end it sounds like a question that that Yaffa probably has a good answer to um, in with, with at least some relatively simple non-gorilla kind of stimuli it's 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 difficult I like I like the the the, the story version. I, I think that we're continuously telling ourselves a story. Well, and the the, the dramatic version of the story version are the people who who write papers like you know the, the, the vision is a grand illusion that you're only seeing the current focus of attention. That I think is is um, not right either. But uh, but I do think you're in effect telling yourself a story about those chickens. Thank you. Whoop. Thanks, Jeremy. So before we move on to Ami, uh, just uh, Ron asked, uh, he said, <clears throat> beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Do you think it, it could also happen in retinal fundus inspection? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I, so look, I, I think that this is a, a, a general phenomenon and, and that, that you'll in, in, in sort of any of these sort of search kinds of tasks, you'll be able to find it. But I'm laughing about the fundus one because, so I'm a professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School um, without any training in ophthalmology. And every now and then the ophthalmology department wants to know what in the world I'm doing. Um, so I gave a talk to ophthalmology on similar sorts of topics. And I deliberately took uh, a fundus picture. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a you know, photograph of the back of the eye. And I put one of those chickens into the fundus. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, an audience of some of the fanciest ophthalmologists, um, you know, it, 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 on, on the continent. Um, and most of them failed to see the, you know, they, they didn't notice the chicken at all. So uh, I believe that it could happen if you end up at your ophthalmologist with a bad case of retinal chicken, you know, there's a chance they'll miss it. So maybe there is a need to develop some kind of software that will put a circle around something that is unusual in the image? You know, so that yeah, in some fashion, this is exactly what computer-aided detection systems are intended to do. Um, even if you limit the um, what, what it's doing to uh, putting a circle around uh, things that might that are mass, you know, might be masses in a mammogram. The difficulty is that when you're looking for something that's relatively rare, almost everything that the computer marks is a false positive, and so you end up in a situation where what the computer that you know the computer's marks have a positive predictive value of. <laughs> 
and, uh, and the radiologist doesn't end up using the information. But absolutely, if we can figure out our way around this sort of prevalence problem, a whole separate talk, um, one of the nice things about computers is that, that they're subject to a different set of rules in many ways, and they're not going to um, uh, they're not going to get bored in the same way that you do, and, and things of that sort. But it, it's it's if you just said, "Hey, computer, circle everything that looks like it might be interesting," the 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 the, the positive predictive value of those marks would be zilch, and and um, and and the user would not use it. All right, Ami. Whoop. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I would like to ask, um, in regards to the model where you spoke about there's a certain amount of time that I'm looking for stimulus, and then I give up and move to the next one. Um, so the question is, what is that threshold? In other words, if I'm looking, you, we had in, in the test that you presented, there was, you're also supposed to look for a certain stimulus and for a category. So I'm, I'm sort of assuming that maybe you look first at the stimulus that takes a certain amount of time. And that is sort of what you're aiming towards that amount of time. And then when you're a categorical factor, which takes longer, so you give up at some point. The question is, what would happen if you first looked at the categorical? Is that even an option? In other words, what determines that threshold of when you give up? So the, uh, the, 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 this idea of um, having a, a, a quitting threshold um, for, at the level of individual selections is, is relatively new and we don't have the data to strictly answer your question yet, but we do know a few things. Um, for answering the rather similar question about when do you give up on a task as a whole, um, we know that this is adaptive um, or can be adaptive. So if you run a hundred trials, you keep track of what you're doing and, and, and um, you keep adjusting your um, quitting threshold so that you produce an acceptable level of, uh, uh, of, of errors, um, basically. So I assume that, uh, th that these sort of uh, micro scale quitting thresholds are similarly adaptive. And we have data that's suggestive of that. So if I, um, uh, if I give you a block, so I, I, I had three um, uh, 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 specific targets and three categorical targets. Suppose I just have you look for the categorical targets. Your error rate goes way, way down. Your reaction time gets longer. All of this suggests that what you did was you adjusted that threshold so that you gave an, a, a, enough time that you you didn't miss as many categorical um, items. If I give you only specific items, um, the overall reaction time is shorter than in the mixed case, probably because you could get away with shortening the, uh, uh, the, the, this individual threshold. So it, it's almost undoubtedly being set adaptively during the task. Now, one of the really interesting problems um, that is really, really hard to figure out how to study properly is that out in the real world, you don't do a hundred trials of the same thing. You know, it, it, and, and, the, uh, in, in, and in radiology, so, so the things we study in radiology, we tend to do lung cancer screening and breast cancer screening. Why? Because they have the trial structure of things we understand from, uh, you know, cognitive science, um, experiments. If you're doing a real world task, um, you're going to need to set the same sort of parameters on the fly for each task as it comes up. And I don't have a good way of, of, uh, of, of understanding how you do that yet, though I suspect that it, you know, a lifetime of, of tuning your deep net the, the giant deep net that is your brain, or taking a look at the next box on, on my screen, I'm sure that the real answer is that it's, uh, that it's there in reverse hierarchy theory if you looked just right. Right, Joel? Right. 
Okay, my turn. I'm wondering what happens during the time that you're accumulating information. Is part of the problem that you're really looking for one of these things at a time and you give up on the lemon and, uh, or you give up on the booth and now you look for the next one and the next one because you're searching in your brain for the different things that you're looking for rather than searching around the screen for the different items. Uh, the, the evidence suggests that that kind of um, search in, in your brain has got to be parallel um, in some fashion, um, coming from a guy who's spent his career advocating usually for the serial side of the, of the equation. <laughs> um, and and okay. sort of one intuition about that uh, is that if I put up an object, a, you know, just a single object on the screen and say, what is this? Mm. You can't possibly be doing that by saying, is it a chicken? Is it a lemon? Is it Shaul? Right. You know, so, so yeah. th that kind of processing simply has to be parallel. But that really points yeah. more strongly to the need for this, um, a, 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 termination um, mechanism sure. that, that Heathcote is pr producing. Yeah. Because yeah. if you put something up, you must be firing off, in effect, a, a zillion diffusers. And you cannot wait for those to terminate, right? You, you, you've, got to, you've got to at some point say, look, I've gotten everything I'm going to get out of this particular act of attentional selection. Let's go select something new. And obviously, you know. Okay. Yeah. Whoop, where'd he go? He vanished. Great to, great oh, to there see you in Jerusalem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just saying, great to see you here. All over the country you are today, not yeah. just in Akko. <laughs> right. Thank you, Shell. Right. So we have another, another question, uh, Jeremy. Can learning strategies for scanning the visual field, can it potentially reduce the miss rates? Um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, it, it, it certainly seems so, so in the mixed hybrid case, um, we, we've found that uh, th things like a, a checklist strategy will reduce errors, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, if you sit with radiologists, particularly who are doing complex, complex tasks, um, you'll often here that they're using very explicit strategies. So a nice example is if you um, don't have just a lung CT, but a whole abdominal CT, um, uh, uh, basically any radiologist, if you ask them what they're doing, they say, oh, I, I, I basically have a sort of a look at the kidneys, look at the liver, look at that. You know, I, I know how I'm gonna go through this rather than just saying, well, I'm just gonna kind of be with the image for a while and see what, what happens. Um, so on the one hand, absolutely, yes, um, the, uh, the, the learning strategies and, and, and uh, strategy, having specific strategies um, will help. Um, on the other hand, um, the, the ones that, that, that there, are, there are versions that you, you know would uh, would could, could could almost eliminate the errors, uh, but you're just not willing to spend the, the the cost, right? You know that in a uh, if you had infinite time in a search for a T versus an L, if you went and uh, took a marker and crossed out each item on the screen as you went through it, you would make very few errors. Um, it wouldn't be worth it to you. It is worth it to you. Actually, ex almost exactly that strategy um, used to be what you did if you were um, in satellite intelligence reading aerial imagery, um, trying to decide, um, you know, where where's the uh, where are the missiles hidden in um, North Korea or something. You take a great big picture and you go through it one bit at a time because you just don't want to miss anything. And even then it's not so easy. Um, but, but, but strategies that can work and still allow you to get home in the evening for dinner, those are more difficult. 
Thank you, Jeremy. Um, maybe we'll take one more question. So <clears throat> another question, does the shape or color of the gorilla, ignoring what these two symbolize together, the gorilla constitute an abnormal finding in the diagnosis? I'm trying to figure out if it's important to locate the gorilla. Oh, so, so um, there, are, there, there are two possible questions um, there. One of them is um, the relationship of the gorilla's features to the main task's features. And yes, um, from uh, Simons and, and Shabras on, we've known that that's important um, in the, uh, the, the uh, if, if you were searching for a white gorilla in the lung, you would do better than a black gorilla because the item you're looking for originally is white. Um, the other question that uh, is at least implicit there is, is this really a decent model of incidental findings? And, um, uh, and that's the question that we got from, so when, when we published the gorilla paper, um, it lit up radiology, social media, and, and uh, I am, uh, it, it's, it's probably the paper that gets quoted back to me um, uh, uh, more often than, than any other of, uh, of mine, including entertaining ones where um, I, I say, oh, I study radiologists, and, and the radiologist I'm talking to says, oh, man, I once upon a time read this wacko paper where this guy, he put a gorilla in the lung. Um, when, so, when radiologist social media got a hold of this, they said, or in, down in the comments section, a bunch of them said, this is stupid. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have missed the gorilla. Well, that I don't believe. Um, the more sensible version of this is stupid was um, when I'm missing an incidental finding, it's something I know I should be looking for. I'm looking in the, in the lung for um, uh, pneumonia and I miss a cancer. That's an important incidental finding. Nobody is looking for a gorilla. And in fact, that's why we developed this mixed hybrid task because we wanted it's obviously not a radiology task, but we wanted to be able to work with a task where you know you're looking for fruit. We told you you're looking for fruit. There's no problem looking for fruit and still you miss one third of the fruit. Um, and the, the, so I'll concede the point to my radiologist colleagues that um, in some fashion, the gorilla is cute, but not, directly a, a fair test, but, um, but it's part of this family of look but fail to see errors um, and their standard incidental finding mistakes are falling into the same, are, are, I, I would bet you are being driven by the same basic factors. Um, but Jeremy, it's also a matter of prevalence, right? I mean, if you had a gorilla on every second trial, then probably people will, would not have missed it. Oh yeah, and and yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, I can, I could go on for the next hour or two about prevalence. Absolutely, it's an important part of this. Uh, I mean, I think prevalence is actually the story of um, why you're missing those typos, right? You're going through and you're identifying word, 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 word. They're all perfectly nice words. You adjust your thresholds. Um, for very quick identification of words, you are you become quite conservative if you're just a normal reader like us and not an editor uh, about typos, and you just blip right over the typo without um, uh, the, the registering it because and, and basically you can think of that as a version of a prevalence effect. It causes you to set your thresholds in in, in the wrong place. If the journal charged you $1,500 for each typo, um, you'd, you'd redo that search. Right. Okay, I think uh, although we're having a lot of fun, and we can stay for another hour asking questions, I think, um, why don't you all unmute yourself and say <laughs> thank you to Jeremy. All right. Jeremy, thank you very much. Next year in real ACO, hopefully. Yeah.
Yeah, or real, some, real, real someplace. Real something, right. <laughs> or at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the Seder, we'll say next year in Jerusalem and I'll mean it. Right, <laughs> right. So we'll pray to have you next year here on Real, for real. And uh, thanks everybody. I just want to remind you that we have at eight, which is 45 minutes from now, we have a social evening. Please come join us. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And tomorrow symposiums start again at 9 a.m. Jeremy, thanks again very much. And um, My pleasure. see you all later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Jeremy, thank you. That was fun. Bye. <laughs>